2 Kings chapter 11. So uh, a lot of us probably know about 30 minutes ago, uh, the president uh, finished giving a, a speech tonight, talking about kind of what's going on. Do you guys realize tomorrow's 9-11? Anybody think about that? Is anybody a little nervous about that? You know, something might happen. Yeah. Oh, he's raising his hand for a Bible. I thought he was yes, I am nervous about that. You know, I'm a little nervous about it, you know. Basically, 13 years ago, some things happened in our country that kind of changed our lives. For a lot of us, really kind of pulled the rug right out from our sense of security. I remember I was at a different church back then, and I remember that following Sunday, tons of people came to church. I don't know if that was your experience, but there was a real boost suddenly. And nowadays, you know, we've got all this crazy stuff happening over in Syria and Iraq with ISIS or the Islamic State, whatever you want to call them. Terrible persecution of Christians and other people. Massive confusion over there on who is in control and who's going to end up in power and have the authority. There's all kinds of brutal, brutal violence going on as there's a, a struggle over there for that. And then, you know, let's not forget to mention what's happening in the Gaza Strip with Israel and Hamas and all that craziness going on. You know, and, and all of this is nothing new. As we're going to see, as we read through the book of Kings, we see there's been war and conflict and a struggle for power and control and authority for thousands of years, Right? It's nothing new. And until the Lord Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom on this earth, it's going to keep happening. Do you realize that? And it happens not only politically and socially and militarily. There's this war going on for power and control. On a personal level, in each of our hearts, every day, there's a battle for who is going to be sovereign and sit on the control of our lives. Is it going to be the Lord Jesus or someone or something else? As long as we live on this planet in these bodies, there's going to be this struggle, this tension, this conflict deep within us about this issue. Who's on the throne of our hearts? And our lives. Our subject tonight, if you're taking notes, is Joash is protected and anointed king. And our objective is that we would learn to allow the Lord Jesus to reign in our lives. And before we jump into the text tonight, as always, let's, let's pray together. Let's ask God together to speak to us through his word through his Holy Spirit, to speak to each one of us what we need to hear tonight. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for a, a time when we can come together still freely, openly, and safely to just worship you, Lord Jesus, in this place. And we come here tonight, Lord, not only wanting to, to worship you, but also wanting to know you more. We need to know you more. Please, Lord, strengthen our faith tonight. Please reveal yourself to each one of us, wherever we are on our journey with you. Please reveal yourself in some new, deep, powerful, personal ways. Let us not just hear your word and understand it cognitively and intellectually, but let us apply it to our lives, to our relationship with you. We just ask that you would accomplish this to your glory through the power of your Holy Spirit who lives in us and is powerful. And we ask this to your glory. Amen. Just a, a bit of context. Uh, I know Pastor Bruce taught the last couple of weeks. Uh, the last couple of chapters, we've seen God raise up this man, Jehu. And basically, he has accomplished through Jehu a, a radical spiritual revolution and, and a cleansing 
in the nor northern kingdom of Israel. Remember, this is the time of the divided kingdom. We've got Israel in the north and Judah in the south. All God's people, they're split right now. And now tonight, when we go to chapter 11, the narrative moves back down to the southern kingdom of Judah. And that's where we're going to be focusing and as we see, just like in the north, there's going to be all kinds of political turmoil, and there's a great struggle going on for power and authority. Who is going to reign? That's what we're looking at tonight. And I want to let you, remind you of this. Underlying all of this, we need to remember God made a promise to King David a long time ago. Way back in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God made a promise to King David that there would always be someone from his line on the throne forever. Just keep that in mind tonight because that's a, a big issue in what we're looking at tonight. So we're looking at 2 Kings chapter 11. Let's just look at the first three verses. And the first thing we're going to see is the king is hidden. Look with me at 2 Kings chapter 11 and verse 1. When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal heirs. But Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered. And they hid him and his nurse in the bedroom from Athaliah so that he was not killed." So he was hidden with her in the house of the Lord for six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. Let's just stop right there. The king is hidden, is this first section. So let's break this down. Ahaziah was the king of Judah, and he was killed by this guy Jehu that I just mentioned back in chapter 9, verse 27. He's killed. And so this Ahaziah's mother, Athaliah, in order to gain the crown because she wanted power and authority and control, decides she's going to kill all the royal heirs. That means this woman was going to kill some of her children and her grandchildren just so she could become queen. How sick is that? I have a one-year-old grandson. His name's Harrison. I should, should have put a picture of him up on the screen, like a good grandparent. The notion that I would do harm to my grandson is just beyond my comprehension. So that gives us a little picture of how evil this lady was. She was so hungry to be in control and to have the power and the authority, she was willing to slay her own grandchildren. Now, we shouldn't be surprised because if we look back, we realize this woman, Athaliah, is actually the daughter of King Ahab and Jezebel. So we know what they were like. King Ahab was arguably the worst, most evil king in Israel, and Jezebel, arguably the worst woman in the history of human beings. This was their daughter. Also, Athaliah's husband, who is now dead, King Joram, when he came into power, first thing he did was kill all his brothers so that he'd be secure in his position. So the apple does not fall far from the tree here. These are evil people. Jehu up north had killed all of Ahab's descendants as fulfillment of God's curse in the house of Ahab. And now down in the south, this lady Athaliah, she wants to destroy all of King David's descendants. There's retribution for that. So we see this in verse 2. We're introduced to one of the daughters of Ahaziah, Jehoshaphat. It doesn't say she's the daughter of Athaliah. It says she's the daughter of King Joram, so it's probably from another woman. But she's the daughter's king, the king's daughter. <laughs> that didn't sound right. She's the king's daughter. She's the half-sister of the king Ahaziah who was killed. And it says that she takes one of his kids, Joash, and we find out, we're going to find out later, he's one year old. He's the same age as my grandson. She takes him and she hides him. Initially it says in the bedroom and then later on it says in verse 3, for six years she hides him in the house of the Lord, in the temple. He's the only one that escapes murderous Athaliah, killing her own grandkids. 
And she hides him, this lady hides this little boy in the temple for six long years. And here's what's so important. This little boy, Joash, he is the last male descendant of King David. It's only through him that the line of David could continue. So he's important. If Athaliah had succeeded in killing all of the male heirs, including Joash, there would have been no messianic line through King David through which the Messiah would have come down the road. So we see big picture. This is actually Satan trying to destroy God's plan to provide a Savior for the world. Big deal. But we're going to see God's plan is not stopped. God's plan will never be stopped. Even when it looks impossible, God is going to accomplish His will and His purpose. Big picture and in your life and my life. And so for six miserable years, this evil queen, Athaliah, reigns in Judah. And she's, she's one of these people that promoted the Baal worship, this awful, sick worship of this false god. She promoted it. She expanded it. It was a dark time under her. Now, there's some really meaningful spiritual parallels to this that I want to pull out tonight. First of all, just as there was a ruthless battle for power in Judah, there is also a, a vicious struggle in each one of our hearts for who's on the throne of our lives. And there are all kinds of people and things out in the world that are fighting to be on that throne in our lives. Trying to push Jesus off where he deserves to be and instead sitting on that throne. And I wanted to brainstorm with us for a minute. What do people tend to put on the throne of their lives instead of Jesus? Does anybody have a thought about that? Yes. Themselves. First of all, self, S-E-L-F. That may be the biggest one. Yes. Family, yes. The things, of this world. the things of this world, the pleasures, the comforts of this world. Yeah, Grant. Career, Career. yes. Takio. Money. money. Jesus said, man, you can't serve God and money. What else? I've got a few more in my mind. Yes. Relationships, Relationships. yes. Whether they're friends, family, yes. Sin. Sin, which is a pretty broad category, but right on. Anybody else have any other thoughts? Yes, Phil. Uh, any, any of that. Smoking, drugs, alcohol, addictions, yes. Escapism, pleasure. <laughs> no, don't say that. <laughs> All our electronics today, social media, yeah. Anything else? Yes. Fame, Fame success, recognition, yeah, it's a good one. Did we get them all? Yeah, Ryan. Power. Let me check my list and see if we got anything here. How about physical looks? How about church? Can we put church on the throne of our lives instead of the Lord Jesus? Yeah. Satan? Fear? All kinds of things. There are all kinds of things in this world vying to sit on the throne of our lives in a position of power and authority and control, just like we see it physically here. And we know there's one who's supposed to be on that throne, right? Jesus Christ. And yet there's always going to be that war, that tension, that conflict, even with ourselves with that. The second thing we see, an interesting spiritual parallel here, 
we, we see the rightful heir of the throne, Joash, right? He's the proper king. For six years, he's hidden away in a room. He's there, but he's not on the throne. He's kind of tucked away and hidden, right? And that can cause us to look at our lives and go, well, is there a part of my life in which I'm not allowing Jesus to reign? Is there a part of your life where you're kind of pushing Jesus to the side or tucking him away somewhere? Oh, he's Lord of all this other stuff, but you got this one little room, this one little part that you haven't surrendered to him, where he's not fully in control. We're not raising our hands on that one. But I challenge you to wrestle with yourself about that. Jesus is Lord. Over and over in Scripture it says He is Lord of all. He is King of kings, Lord of lords. He's sovereign. He's a creator. I could go on and on and on. And we know this. And yet there's still a struggle to yield to Him in every area of our lives as our sovereign King and Lord. And yet that's what He wants, that's what He commands, and that's really what's best for us. These areas that we're holding back, we're hurting ourselves. And we're grieving Him. Let's move on to the second section here, verses 4 to 12, and we see the king is revealed. This gets kind of interesting. Look with me at verse 4. In the seventh year, Jehoiada sent and brought the captains of hundreds of the bodyguards and the escorts and brought them into the house of the Lord to him. And he made a covenant with them and took an oath from them in the house of the Lord and showed them the king's son. Then he commanded them, saying, this is what you shall do. One-third of you who come on duty on the Sabbath shall be keeping watch over the king's house. One-third shall be at the gate of Sur, and one-third at the gate behind the escorts. You shall keep the watch of the house, lest it be broken down. Verse 7, the two contingents of you who go off duty on the Sabbath shall keep the watch of the house of the Lord for the king. But you shall surround the king on all sides, every man with his weapons in his hand, and whoever comes within range, let him be put to death. You are to be with the king as he goes out and as he comes in. So the captains of the hundreds did according to all that Jehoiada the priest commanded. Each of them took his men who were to be on duty on the Sabbath with those who were going off duty on the Sabbath and came to Jehoiada the priest. And the priest gave the captains of hundreds the spears and shields which had belonged to King David that were in the temple of the Lord." Then the escorts stood, every man with his weapons in his hand, all around the king, from the right side of the temple to the left side of the temple, by the altar and the house. And verse 12, and he brought out the king's son, put the crown on him, and gave him the testimony. They made him king and anointed him, and they clapped their hands and said, long live the king. So we see the king is revealed in this section. So we meet a new person, Jehoiada. He's a priest. He's a priest of the true and living God. He's actually the husband of Jehosheba, the lady who hid Joash. Right? He's a man of God. His, his name means the Lord knows, which is so appropriate here. God knows everything that's going on. He's got a plan and he's in control. He gathers a bunch of the soldiers and the military leaders together in the temple and he makes them swear allegiance and then he reveals Joash, the king's son who's still alive, the true legitimate king. You can imagine their shock. I mean, for six years, they've assumed there were no more ancestors of King David. For six years, they were stuck under the, the leadership of this evil queen, Athaliah. For six years, they thought, there's no answer, there's no more help. There's no hope. They were stuck. And then after six years, lo and behold, here's this little now seven-year-old boy who's the true legitimate heir to the throne. And he'd been there the whole time, but they didn't know it. 
And instead, they'd been under the authority and the leadership of this evil woman, this evil queen. And there's such a parallel there to what happens in this world today. Jesus Christ is here. He's real. He's available. And yet there are so many people living in the world who don't even know He's here, and they're living under the power and the authority and the domination of the devil or the world or all these things that we mentioned earlier that try and sit on the throne of our lives. That's why we know people need to know about Jesus. They need to be set free. They need to see the light. So many people live without any hope and not realizing things can change. God can change people's hearts and minds and lives and circumstances. But they don't know that. That's one of the big jobs that we as believers and followers in Christ have is to go out and just tell the good news to people, the gospel, that people so desperately need to hear, even though they don't even realize they need it. (laughs) Even though they don't want to hear it still our job to go and share it. So Jehoiada gives very specific instructions to these soldiers and these military leaders. To basically, he's setting up this whole thing to protect. Remember, this is a little seven-year-old kid here, and he's trying to protect him against this evil woman who has massacred her own grandchildren, right? So he sets up this whole thing with all these soldiers and all these military guys gives them weapons and everything, arranges them all to really just protect this little kid. And then he brings out Joash. He's been in the temple for six years. Out comes this little seven-year-old kid, right? He brings him out, puts a crown on his head, gives him the testimony. The testimony was a copy of the law, the Mosaic law. And way back in in the book of Moses, it was written, God told them that every king should have a copy of his law that he kept with him at all times to give him wisdom and guidance and direction in his life. Doesn't that sound like good advice? That's what we have today. So he gives him a copy of the testimony. He anoints him with oil, which is symbolic of God's choosing of this young boy, God's approval of him. And everybody sees this and they clap their hands and they celebrate and they start crying out, long live the king, long live the king. Can you imagine what this little boy felt like, you know? But he was the true heir to the throne. The joy that they must have felt. A new king, the true king, the deserving king is here. One who can set us free from this evil tyranny and this terrible leadership and idolatry of this queen. And you know, this this is the freedom that we can and we do experience when we come to Christ. We don't always feel it, but I hope you can at least think back to a time when you experience this kind of freedom and joy, having Jesus in your life. I've had multiple times, I mean, I can think back to the very first time when I got saved, when the Lord pulled me out of some dark pits, just the joy I had and the freedom, the happiness and and the hope, the excitement of, of knowing God. Do you remember that in your life? I hope you can. If you can, I want you to spend some time and wrestle with that, because that's what we That's what we have in Jesus. And he sets us free from the evil and the bondage and the sin and the darkness and the idolatry and all that stuff. Now there's some real powerful foreshadowing that we see here in this story with Joash. And I just want to make sure we see these things. Number one, just as Joash was revealed as Judah's true king here, Jesus has been revealed as the king of the universe. You can read uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, talking about God in days past spoke through prophets, but now he's spoken through his son. And his son, Jesus, is the exact image of him. He's been revealed. 
the true king. And just as Joash was given a crown to wear, well, Jesus wears a crown. When he came the first time, he wore a crown of thorns. When he comes back again, Revelation 14, 14 tells us he's going to be wearing a golden crown, the crown of kingship, the crown of victory. Just as Joash was anointed by Jehoiada, Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Luke 4, 18, the Holy Spirit came down. He said, I've been anointed to proclaim the gospel. And we see the crowd here with Joash crying out, Long live the king! And we read in Hebrews 13, 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will live and reign forever. Joash died. He lived a long time, but he died. King Jesus, forever. But there's some beautiful parallels and foreshadowing there of the king with a capital K. And so we see the king is hidden. We've just seen the king revealed. And the last section here we'll look at, we see the king is worshipped. Look with me at verses 13 to 21. Now when Athaliah heard the noise of the escorts and the people, she came to the people in the temple of the Lord. When she looked, there was the king standing by a pillar according to custom, and the leaders and the trumpeters were by the king. All the people of the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets. So Athaliah tore her clothes and cried out, Treason! Treason! And Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains of the hundreds, the officers of the army, and said to them, Take her outside under guard and slay with the sword whoever follows her. For the priest had said, Do not let her be killed in the house of the Lord. Verse 16, So they seized her, and she went by way of the horse's entrance into the king's house, and there she was killed. Then Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord, the king, and the people, that they should be the Lord's people, and also between the king and the people. And all the people of the land went to the temple of Baal and tore it down. They thoroughly broke in pieces its altars and images and killed Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars. And the priest appointed officers over the house of the Lord." Verse 19, then he took the captains of hundreds, the bodyguards, the escorts, and all the people of the land, and they brought the king down from the house of the Lord and went by way of the gate of the escorts to the king's house. Then he sat on the throne of the kings. So all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was quiet, for they had slain Athaliah with the sword in the king's house. And verse 21, Jehoash, or Joash, it's spelled two different ways, was seven years old when he became king. The king is worshipped. I mean, imagine Queen Athaliah's surprise. She hears this commotion and she walks in and there's this little boy. Maybe she recognizes him. It is one of her grandchildren. But he's obviously been set up and he's being honored and recognized as the king. Here she thought all this time she'd wiped all that out. Surprise, surprise. God still had a plan, and it was going to happen. And so she tries to turn the tide by tearing her clothes and starting to scream, treason, treason, and no, that ain't going to work. No. So Jehoiada the priest, he commands that she be taken out of the temple. Her blood should not be shed in God's house. If anybody follows her, they're going to die too. And they take her out. And she is slain. And it's about time. And then Jehoiada does something interesting. He basically facilitates two covenants, two agreements, two two promises. He renews the covenant between God and the people. That they should be the Lord's people. That he will be their king. He will be their Lord. He will sit on the throne of their lives. And he also makes a covenant, facilitates a covenant between the king and the people because the people need to support God's chosen leader. Promises. And then they go down to the temple of Baal, this terrible place that the queen has been promoting, expanding all these years, and they rip it down. They totally, utterly destroy it. And the guy who was the priest of Baal, 
They kill him. And then there's this wonderful grand procession. All these people bringing Joash down from the temple down to the king's house where he's officially placed on the throne and recognized as their new king. This little boy, isn't that wild? And, and I love that. It says in verse 20, so all the people of the land rejoiced and the city was quiet. There's rejoicing and celebration and there's peace. Like they haven't known for a long time because God's man, boy, is on the throne now. And again, if we take this, we can pull some powerful applications to our lives today. Number one, just as Jehoiada the priest had to eliminate or kill Athaliah, this evil queen, we have to look at our lives and remove anyone who is challenging Jesus' reign in our hearts. It's easy for us to put other people in that position of power and influence and control and authority in our lives. I see this a lot of times in counseling. Sometimes it's a spouse. We put our spouse before the Lord. Sometimes it's our children. It could be a boss, some other relationship. But we cannot let anyone take the place of Jesus in our hearts and our lives. We have to, I'm not saying we have to go kill them. Does everybody, we're all clear on that, right? Metaf metaphorically, we've got to get rid of them. We've got to take them out of that place. It's that important, though. So I ask you, think about your life for a minute. Hopefully you are. Are you in a relationship with someone who is taking the place of Jesus in your life? The second thing is that just as Jehoiada the priest, he made a covenant with God and with the people, we need to make and be in covenant with Jesus too. And here's what this covenant looks like. It's really a good deal. We repent of our sin and we put our faith in Jesus Christ. That's our part. God on His part forgives us of our sin, indwells us with His Holy Spirit, gives us new life, and gives us eternal life and adopts us into His family. And then in response, we are now dead to ourselves and we live in and through Jesus Christ to His glory instead of our own for the rest of the of our lives. That's, that's the kind of covenant, that's the kind of deal that God offers to each of us. It's a good deal because He loves us and He knows what's best for us and we need Him. I hope you've made that, that covenant, that agreement, that transaction with the Lord. If you're here tonight and you haven't, you can do that tonight. That's what God wants. It's just about us acknowledging our sin and confessing and repenting of it and then putting our faith in Jesus, who he is and what he did on the cross for us and inviting him to come in and giving our lives to him and then letting him live in and through us, make us more like him one day at a time. And then we know our sins are forgiven. Talk about freedom and peace. We know that no matter what happens in this crazy world, we're going to heaven for eternity in paradise. That's a good deal. The third thing, thing we see is just as the people destroyed the temple and the priest of Baal, this false worship, this idolatrous evil stuff, we have to get rid of anything in our lives that we worship other than Jesus Christ. We talked earlier about what all these things could be. Our jobs, other people, family, money, fame, success, our bodies, possessions, all this stuff. We, if we find ourselves getting obsessed by these things, if we find ourselves thinking about any of these things, investing in any of these things more than our relationship with the Lord, 
we got a problem. It's called idolatry. And again, just as they were ruthless, we've got to be ruthless with ourselves. Jesus said, if your eye causes you to stumble, cut it out and throw it from it. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. He's, he's using dramatic imagery to, to, to let us know how important this is. If we have anything in our lives that we're more passionate about than the Lord Jesus, we're missing it. And we're offending our King. And we're missing what He wants to do and be in our lives. So I ask you, keep your hands down, but I ask you to think about your life. What part or maybe parts of your life do you need to remove or reduce in order to worship the Lord Jesus more completely? I know for me, I've got a few, <laughs> but one of them is this sense of accomplishment that I feel like I need to keep moving forward or trying to accomplish something to feel good about myself. I don't know if you can understand this. It's, maybe you can. But I, I know that's something I struggle with. Instead of being able to just let that go and just be who I am in the Lord. That's a hard thing for me, man. What is it for you? And the fourth thing we see, which is really cool, and I've mentioned it a little bit, is just as placing the true king on the throne brought joy and peace to the people in Judah. When we get to the place where we will let the Lord Jesus truly be on the throne of our lives and worship Him first and only and let Him have control, we can experience a joy and a peace that goes beyond anything that this crazy, evil world can throw at us. Jesus said He came to give us peace. Jesus talked about the joy that we can experience in knowing Him. But we most completely experience that as we let Him be in control in every part of our lives. So, so how is it for you? Are you experiencing this, this joy and this peace that, that the Lord offers? Is that a reality for you? You know, for me, I'd have to answer sometimes yes, sometimes no. In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Some parts of my life, yes. Some parts of my life, no. And I imagine that's probably your experience too. And here's the deal. Perhaps... In those areas of our lives where we're really not experiencing the fullness of the Lord's peace and joy, maybe those are the areas that we're still holding on to and that Jesus isn't quite sitting on the throne of yet. And that as we learn more and more about surrendering those areas of our lives to Him, trusting Him, about those areas of our lives, confessing and repenting to Him about those areas of our lives. As we begin to do that, that peace, that joy will grow and we'll be set free from the, the fears and the anxieties and the worries and the stresses and the pressures that we feel because we're holding on. Do you believe that, that Jesus is Lord of all? I know most of us intellectually would say, yes, I do. Then he needs to be and he wants to be Lord of every part of your life too. Every part. And the beauty is, because of who he is and his love for us, as we learn to, to surrender these difficult parts to him, it's good for us. 
because he loves us. He's in control. His plan, he's revealed his plan to us, and it's going to happen, just like it did here in this story. And you know what? Joash lived, and David's line continued, and Jesus was born, just as God said. The Messiah came. He lived a perfect life. He willingly went to the cross to die for our sins, yours and mine. He rose from the dead, just like God's plan said he would. And you know what else it says? Someday he's coming back. He's going to come back. And when he comes back, he's going to come back wearing that golden crown, kicking some butt. I can say that on Wednesday night. And he's going to be the victorious king that we read about and we, we can imagine, but we're going to experience it and see it. And he wants to now, not then, he wants to now reign in every part of our lives. But he won't, here's the thing, he won't force himself, right? He never forces himself. We have to willingly surrender, trust, yield, believe. But we can ask him to help us do that. Lord, help me. That's a legitimate prayer. <laughs> so as we close tonight, I guess I'd like to challenge each of us to really examine our lives and to honestly confess to the Lord the area or areas we have that we haven't really totally fully surrendered or trusted or yielded to him yet. Let's pray together. God, I just pray for each of us right now. Help us to be honest with ourselves, Lord. Show us our sin so we can confess it before you and be cleansed, be healed, be forgiven. Please give us the faith we need, Lord Jesus, to to trust you enough to give you all of our lives, every part, those things that we worry about, those things that we're hiding, those things that we're ashamed of, those things that we stress about and feel insecure. Lord, help us to give all of that to you, to let you be Lord in those areas. Help us to trust in your power and your love, your ability to cleanse and heal and forgive, control. Help us to trust in your good plan, not only for the world, but for each one of us individually, Lord. I thank you for dying on the cross for each one of us individually. Just ask, Lord, that you'd help us to surrender more of ourselves to you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for who you are and all you've done for us. May, may this be done for your glory, Lord Jesus. Amen.